Um, thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, emotions, and the title of my talk is There's No Point in Crying Over Spilt Milk, or Is There? Why do we have emotions, and why perhaps couldn't we manage without them? So uh, one characteristic of being human is that as well as our ability to think and reason and remember and navigate the world in what John called the thinking part of our brain, at the same time we're always feeling something. Now sometimes those feelings are so predominant that we actually notice them and label them and they, we call them emotions, like we might feel sad or angry, or we call them moods, we're feeling low and depressed or anxious. But even if we don't have these overt emotions, there's always going to be some kind of feeling state that's there. We're never without it. So we might shut our eyes and just notice how we're feeling. And sometimes it's just a sense of feeling good or bad, tired or, or really up, and we can't really label it, but it's always there all of the time. So I'm a clinical psychologist and I spend a lot of time with people where these feeling states actually really intrude and dominate their lives through painful, often difficult emotions that they can't escape. And this has led um, emotions to have a really bad press over, over the centuries. This, this ability to intrude into life and not really appear to offer any benefits to the human condition. So the argument has often been, well, these emotions might have been useful for other animals or for our very primitive ancestral past, but now that we've developed these amazing frontal cortical parts of our brain that allow us to reason and think about the world, emotions are just a sort of thing that gets in the way. And we can see this through things like the, the work of the ancient Greeks. Um, for example, the Stoics thought that emotions were some things that just have to be controlled as much as possible. You have to override them. And, that, and a sign of being civilized and sophisticated was the extent to which you could regulate and control your emotions and never let them cloud your judgment. Um, world religions such as Buddhism have this notion of an uncontrollable elephant. And uh, the mind as an elephant rider trying to control this, this beast within, which is always taking you off in different directions. And you have to... You have to master it and control it over time. Freud, of course, had this notion of um, the id, which had to be controlled by the ego, which itself was controlled by the superego. So whole layers of control to deal with these uh, primitive urges within us, which no longer uh, have any use for us. And, of course, in popular culture, we see the mild-mannered Bruce Banner turning into the Incredible Hulk whenever he gets angry. So he tiptoes around his own personality all of the time, trying not to get upset about anything. But every episode, amazingly, he still gets upset. And, uh, and of course, Star Trek, where two of the characters, the very passionate and emotional Captain Kirk, with the half-Vulcan character, Mr. Spock, who famously didn't feel emotions at all, would navigate the world through logic alone. And they would always have very different views on how to solve the problems that uh, occurred to them. So what I'm going to argue is that this view, this historical view, is actually incorrect, that emotions aren't just a carryover from our evolutionary past, which are no longer useful to us, but actually they're essential to how we navigate our day-to-day -day world every single day, even for modern humans with their fantastic evolved ability to think and reason. So I'm going to talk about some of the reasons why emotions are important. The first is um, that logical, rational thought is quite a slow process, relatively speaking. And often we need to react to things, into the world much, with, to things in the world much more quickly. And we need to reconfigure our mind, our brain, our bodies to respond to things that happen which might have good or bad consequences for us. And just thinking through slowly what all the options are is not going to be fast enough for us to do this. So of course in the evolutionary past this was more important, but even now it's absolutely critical to how we deal with life. So um, if I just think of one cascading set of emotions, anxiety right through to blind terror, you can see that those emotions are, have different roles in how we might respond to the world. So if I, for example, I said, um, well, in this box, I've got a, a tarantula spider, which I'm about to get out and we're going to play with it. And you didn't really like spiders. You might feel some kind of trepidation and anxiety. So this would be a, bit, a mixture of what John called thinking with your heart, a bit of anxiety, but also thinking with your head. Well, I'm not sure about this. What can I do? And as the, as the tarantula was brought out, you'd get more anxious. If the tarantula was brought close to you, you might start feeling really afraid, less of the thinking of your head and much more of the, the emotional state. And eventually, if the tarantula was sort of thrown at you, you'd feel this terrible sense of, of terror, unless you, unless you were very uh, stoical. And uh, there would be no real thinking at all. You'd be running out of the room or doing, some, doing something that was out of your control. 
So this kind of notion of emotions as ways of taking over the system, driving your behaviour uh, in the face of things that are ra need rapid responses is one of their really key uh, functions. And John talked about how we can understand emotions by looking at the brain in the scanner, and he talked about watching films. And when we've done work on this, we thought, well, films are great. They can get you the kind of anxiety, but you always know it's a film. Maybe if we want to understand this sort of blind terror, we have to do something a bit different. So one study we did a few years ago with my postdoc, Dean Mobbs, we thought, well, what if we could actually put people in the scanner and take their shoes off so they've got just their socks on and then move a tarantula closer and closer to their bare foot. <laughs> Would we then suddenly not just see this nice amygdala bit of the brain that John talked about, but this blind terror centre, which is right in the bottom primitive part of the brain. So that's what we decided to do. We put our ethics application in and they said, well, actually, I don't think it's really ethical to do that to people. <laughs> so what we decided to do was pretend to people that they were having a tarantula. So we got this big plastic box with different compartments and they could see it through the video camera. And then we went down to, um, I'll see, see if I've got a picture. This is the, this is the tarantula we used. So th this is it. They had, their, they had their foot in this box, and then they saw the tarantula being moved closer. But actually, it was a video of a tarantula being moved closer. So we had a great day in this place called Hampshire Tarantulas, where we went down and we filmed with our box, and we filmed the tarantulas moving backwards and forwards with our, our gloves on. The, the tarantulas were very nice in the end. <laughs> And, uh, and then to, to up the ante, we thought, well, they have to see a tarantula. So we found this amazing robot-controlled tarantula. And we built a cage for it in the scanner, and we put some twigs in, and you could make it move. So they'd come in, and we'd go, well, the tarantula's over there. Um, and they'd look over, and then uh, the PhD student was helping us would move the controls, and the tarantula would scuttle around. And, go, oh, oh. And, and of course, we didn't want them to see that there was nothing in the box, so we put a, cut, a sheet over the end of the scanner, so they just saw the video feed. And we said, we have to do this, because sometimes the tarantula escapes. <laughs> and we don't, want it to we don't want it to scuttle up into the scanner. So anyway, we did this, and we, um, we, 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 they, we filmed what was happening in their brain using the MRI scanner um, as the tarantula moved close to their feet. And we also asked them how frightened they were. And we, what we wanted to see was, let's get beyond this anxiety to sort of as close to sheer terror as we can. What's interesting with, with scanning is you have this problem called movement artifacts. People move around a bit, and it makes the brain go a bit uh, uh, fuzzy because their head's not still. We had the most rigid unmoving people we've ever seen in a, in a study. They just, like, no, there was no movement artifacts at all. So it's a great way to stop people moving. They were frozen yeah. with terror. So anyway, this is the actual photo of how we set them up. And um, so the first thing was we've got these ratings of, of fear, and six on this scale was as frightened as I've ever been in my life. And you can see people got up to around a five when the tarantula was right next to their... Um, uh, for, they actually did have socks on. We we're not, we're not um, uh, sadists. Um, <laughs> right, right, right up next to their foot. And what happens in the brain? Well, this bit of the brain which we're interested in, this midbrain part, actually the periaqueductal grey matter, right in the most primitive part of the brain, you can see it's actually turned off. That's this activation below this horizontal line. And it only turns on, <clears throat> becomes active, when the tarantula is right by the foot. So this was a great way of looking at um, these emotions as emergency services. At this point, they're completely frozen with fear, and this bit of the brain is taking over, and there's not much of the thinking brain active at all. And of course, fear and anxiety are just one of our emotional toolkit. We have a whole set of emotions to deal with things in the world that we need to rapidly respond to. Some of them are positive, many of them are negative, because we've evolved to deal with bad things, because that's what keeps us alive. So a massive range of negative emotions, much smaller range of positive emotions. And we've got this fantastic toolkit to reconfigure ourselves in all these different ways. So another um, aspect, which um, I think John alluded to when he said you're, you're thinking with your heart, um, is the notion which we, which we label following your heart, having gut feelings, my intuition told me to do X, Y, and Z. So as well as this sort of rational, logical, Mr. Spock type thinking, we've got this emotional way of thinking about the world as well, and an emotional way of making decisions. What should I do in this situation? And the reason why this is important is because most of the time we have to make decisions, we just don't have all the information. So life isn't like a chess board where we know all the pieces and all of the possible moves. 
there's lots and lots of missing information. It's like you took half the pieces off and you don't know where they are. So the rational, logical way of approaching the world is just not going to cut it. You need some other system to help you say, well, what might you do in this situation? And the way it seems to work is we look for patterns in situations that in the past have been good or bad. So little bits of a situation which we relate to something good or something bad that's happened. And we've got a whole set of these patterns. And then when we see them again in a new situation, we have a sort of tingling feeling, which we don't even really notice, which says, oh, this is this, something bad's about to happen here, or this is a good de decision to make. And one of the reasons we know that this system's so important, and it involves a part of the brain called the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, is that there's been people for whom that part of the brain has been very badly damaged. And they are almost completely disabled in their ability to make decisions in the world. And a very famous one is this man, Phineas Gage. Um, so remarkably, he was a foreman in a mining company. And one of the things you have to do is tamp down. You can see him with this tamping iron in the, in the portrait. You have to tamp down the dynamite into a hole. It just seems like a really stupid thing to do. But you, know, you bash the dynamite. <laughs> And sure enough, one day he was doing this, and this tamping iron went straight through his eye and out the top of his head. And there's a reconstruction there. You can see where it went through. And it went through this part of the brain that we now know mediates this kind of intuitive, emotional decision-making. And he was still able to talk about all the rules about how you should navigate your way through the world, all the logic and rational way of doing it, but he was completely unable to do it. He was very disabled in social situations. He ended up losing his job. His wife left him. He became estranged from his children because he just couldn't feel his way through the world in the way that we all have to do. And that's because we need this intuitive emotion system to help us navigate everyday life. And without it, we're very, very disabled. And it's not just... Um, it's not just small decisions in life that we need it for. It seems to uh, be relevant to big decisions. So I was just going to say a little bit about that. So there's this notion of implicit egotism. So one thing we have this little tingling emotional feeling to, a positive feeling, is anything to do with ourselves. So if I show someone uh, big letters of the alphabet and just they look through um, the letters and I measure, say, their skin conductance, their heart rate or brain activity, what you find is... Um, so my name's Tim, there's the letters T-I-M, you get a little surge of positive emotion when you see the letters of your own name because it relates to you. So anything that's to do with you or yourself, you get this little extra buzz from, even though you're not aware of it, but you can detect it uh, in the laboratory. So there's a cartoon for you too, uh, which I'm sure you're all familiar with that scenario. So a group of researchers about 20 years ago did this great study on this. So they said, well, what if this little surge of, of positive feelings to do with your own name actually influenced all of the big decisions that you might make in your life? So things like where you're going to live in the world, who your lifetime partner might be, what your profession might be. And so they get all of the census information from the US and various other countries around the world, and they controlled for frequencies of names and jobs and so on, and they said, is it more likely that you would choose a profession that has the same letters in it as your own name? Of course it can't be. Surely not. Surely we make these big life decisions in a much more sophisticated way. Are you more likely to spend your life and marry someone who has a name that's similar to yours than someone dissimilar? Are you likely to live in a place... Um, that has similar letters in it to your own name. And so they controlling for all of these possible confounds, they showed that that was indeed the case, that there's a small but reliable effect that you're more likely to be um, living somewhere with someone in a profession that mirrors the letters in your own name. So this idea of implicit egotism. So if you're um, someone here, Cameron, who's a carpenter, married to Carol, working here in Cambridge, now you know <laughs> why. <laughs> Um, so that's another th reason we have emotions, um, uh, to, to, to make sure we make choices that are relevant to ourselves. Another reason is planning for the future. So what's interesting about the human mind is we can plan for things many, many, many years in advance. But who are we making those plans for? Not for ourselves. We're making them for a person we've never met, our future self, 10 15, 20 years ahead, or even next week. We don't know that person. So how do we make those plans for that person in the future when we don't really know what they're going to be like, what they want? Well, we simulate what we think they'll be like. So we, and the simulation has to use 
what we think are important at the moment. So we make plans based on our own priorities and we run a little simulation and that simulation leads to feelings. And if those feelings are good or bad, that helps us make the choices um, about what we're going to do for that person in the future. And of course, this is a fraught, fraught with danger and we see this all the time. So you might make plans with the friends to go out on a Friday and have a pizza and you think, oh, you do your simulation, oh, that's going to be a nice thing to do. Obviously, you don't think I'm doing a simulation. You just think, oh, yeah, that would be great. Friday comes, you're like, oh, God, I can't really face going out. Well, I, I do sometimes. I can't really face going out because the person that, making, I, that I was making the plans for, Friday me, I, I w was different to the person who made the plans. And the more time in advance you make these plans, the further and further it goes goes away. But in, critical to making those plans is getting a sense of how that future person might feel by building a simulation of how they will view the world. And a final role for emotions is, is the social one. So we communicate all the time with our feelings um, things that are going on to other people and it's in, integral to how we relate to each other. So we might communicate fear in the case of the spider. We might communicate a need for uh, help uh, by being distressed. We might have communal emotions that are collective, like the, the crowd, and so on. So social emotions are incredibly important, a way of interacting and a way of bonding us together. So to sum up then, I've tried to say that people are never in a state entirely free from feeling. Sometimes it's just a background hum. Often it's a thing which we can label and identify. And those feelings act as first responders, and we have a whole toolkit of different emotions that can deal with things in different situations. They guide our decisions, they help us make plans for the future, and they help us interact with, with others. So going back to Captain Kirk, sometimes a feeling is all we humans have to go on. Thank you very much. <laughs>